At this point in time, all of you, or at least most of you, have heard the statement, Gaza is the biggest open prison in the world. So today we're going deep into that story. The story of the Gaza Strip, its history, its people, its borders, and who benefits from you thinking that it's the biggest prison in the world. The Gaza Strip is a small piece of land on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It borders Egypt on the southwest and Israel on the east and the north. People have lived in Gaza for millennia, but for today's purposes, we're focusing on the history starting in 1947. In 1947, the entire land is inhabited both by Arabs and Jews and controlled by the British Empire. It's already riddled with violence, fueled by competing national aspirations. Then the UN proposes the partition plan, a two-state solution with Jerusalem as its international city. The Palestinians were to receive the Western Galilee, the Sumerian highlands, and the coastal plains south of Jaffa, including the Gaza Strip. Jewish leaders accepted this plan reluctantly, of course, and the Palestinians, along with the Arab countries around them, opposed any partition leading to a Jewish state, igniting the 1948 war. Following Egypt into war were Iraq, Jordan, that back then was known as Transjordan, Lebanon, and Syria. The Egyptians attack from within Egypt, and this is important to note, from Egypt, they wash through the Gaza Strip and then up the coastal plains towards Tel Aviv. And with much effort, this wasn't at all an easy battle. The young state of the time pushes them back to the Gaza Strip, establishing that first sliver as we know it today. At the end of the war, Gaza was occupied by Egypt. What's interesting is they never annexed the Gaza Strip. It forever remained, even under Egyptian control, an area controlled by military governance, but not fully citizens or people with full rights. Egypt maintained control over Gaza for 19 years. And in that 19-year period, it's not like everything is peaceful in the Gaza Strip. There's a ton of refugees that have sort of come in the Gaza Strip. There's a lot of violence, and they're under military control. But not only that, there was no fence back then. So those communities in the Gaza Strip continuously throughout the period go out and murder Jewish communities that border them. In 1967, the 19-year control of the Egyptians in the Gaza Strip ends with a six-day war. What was that war? A quick reminder, it's this incredibly swift six-day battle where Israel quadruples its landmass in a strategic attempt to push hostile forces further away from its borders and to gain some strategic depth. This is when Gaza first came under Israeli control. Over the years, tension between Gaza and Israel continued to rise. But in 1993, things seemed like they could change for the best with the start of the Oslo Accords. Finally, the time is approaching when there will be safety in Israel's house, when the Palestinian people will write their own destiny. So sidebar, what are the Oslo Accords? The Oslo Accords were a series of agreements starting in the early 90s that were supposed to gradually bring together the Israelis on the one side, the Palestinians on the other side, with the ultimate goal of having two states, one Jewish state called Israel, one Palestinian state called Palestine. The Gaza Strip was part of that agreement. The first Oslo Accords is basically this general statement of, we accept your existence as a people, which sounds basic to us today, but back then there was a lot. The next set of accords was 1995, and they go way farther into detail of where the borders are gonna be, what the future Palestinian state is gonna look like. And again, all of this encompasses also the Gaza Strip. At the same time as the Israeli government and the Palestinian leadership are negotiating, there are extremists on both sides who are strongly opposed to these accords. In Israel, an extremist murders our then Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. In the Palestinian side, you have the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, Palestinian terrorist organizations, who do everything they can to stop the accords. And what does everything they can mean? It means they're murdering Israeli civilians in the streets of our country. In 2000, we have this big attempt to jumpstart the Oslo Accords, in which the US, of course, the Israelis and the Palestinians come together in Camp David in the US to try and rekindle this ongoing discussion. Ehud Barak is our prime minister at the time, he shows up with whatever mandate he had from the government, and Yasser Arafat, Palestinian leader, shows up. And for whatever reason, he can't or will not move on with the Accords. If you look at the big picture timeline of history, that last Camp David meeting is sort of the last ditch attempt 
to restart the Oslo Accords. After that, we really never have an effective one. In fact, the Palestinians start what we now call the Second Intifada in late 2000, which is a five-year ongoing terrorist attack on the heart of Israel. It was suicide bombers blowing up on buses, in cafes, in malls across Israel. That is the reality I grew up to as a teenager. The Palestinians did everything they could to sabotage the peace accords. And on the Israeli side, our population strongly lost faith that there's a chance to really reach meaningful peace with the Palestinians. Many years down the line, we find out that Arafat's second intifada that was marketed as this grassroots movement wasn't as spontaneous as it was pegged to be. In fact, it was meticulously planned by the PLO, by the Palestinian Authority, to sabotage the peace with Israel. So how is all of this related to the Gaza Strip and today's topic? Let's go back to the Gaza Strip. So from the 90s through the early 2000s, Gaza has a mix of Palestinian cities, which are the vast majority of the population, and Israeli communities that are spread out on the coast, on the eastern side, and in the north of the Gaza Strip. In the absence of peace negotiations with the Palestinians, and in response to the ongoing threat of terrorism, in 2005, the Israeli government, led by Ariel Sharon, does something that no one has ever done in history. We decided to pull out of the Gaza Strip with no agreement, with no preconditions, with nothing, just with a point to stop the violence, to stop the terrorism. Every Israeli citizen and soldier are pulled out of the Gaza Strip till the last one. It's important to know that this was not easy for the Israeli people. In fact, till this day, the 2005 disengagement from the Gaza Strip is considered to be one of the most divisive events in Israeli history. Till this day, people talk back to that event as one of the causes for our current political conflict. No more Israelis inside the Strip, no Israeli military presence. The Israeli-Gaza border crossings were to be used only for the passage of goods, aid, and individuals with permits from within Gaza into Israel or goods into Gaza. Control of the Gaza-Egypt border was handed over to Egypt. And the expectation was that this move on our end would allow the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip to finally have the peace, to have the freedom that they wanted, to have the control of their own land, and to finally move away from violence. So Israel withdraws from the Gaza Strip in 2005, leaves behind the Palestinians, who a year later, 2006, have national elections. The Hamas wins. They don't win all the votes, but they win enough to overthrow the Fatah, the PLO, and they don't do this in the democratic way. They violently and murderously throw them out of the Gaza Strip. There have been no other elections since in Gaza. So the Gaza Strip was now under Hamas control, which openly called and still calls for the destruction of the entire state of Israel. We continue to give them water. We continue to give them electricity. We continue to have tens of thousands of Palestinians work inside of Israel, and the violence continues from the Gaza Strip again and again and again. The Israeli-Gaza border has been the crossing point of numerous terrorist attacks, abusing Israel's permits, coming into the country to kill soldiers and civilians alike. And the communities along the Israeli side of the border have become so accustomed to the rocket attacks from the Gazan side that everywhere you look, you'll see bomb shelters. With a hostile entity along its border, Israel resorted to tightening the border points between Israel and Gaza, saying, if you want open passage, at least recognize our country's right to exist. Since 2006, that has not yet happened. I think if there was anyone who had any doubts about how much of a necessity having a strong border with the Gaza Strip is, those doubts disappeared on October 7th with a vicious attack of the Hamas against the innocent civilians of Israel. There's this claim that's constantly made that Israel is the one that controls all the entry and exit of the Gaza Strip, but that's of course not true. Israel controls the eastern side and the northern side bordering with Israel. But they have a whole big border that borders with the Egyptians. And that border is controlled by the Egyptians since 2005. So who benefits the misleading statement that Gaza is a prison controlled by Israel? There are ulterior motives at play here. Hamas are a terrorist group that is part of Iran's network. It's Iran fighting through Hamas, attacking Israel. 
The biggest victims of the Hamas actions and the Iranian government behind them are the Palestinian people living in the Gaza Strip. If you've seen any of the footage coming out of the Gaza Strip lately, it's impossible not to feel empathy and compassion for the people of that Strip. The Hamas took the water pipes that were donated and they used it for rockets. They took the fertilizer meant for building the land and used it for explosives. They took the construction materials continuously brought in to build tunnels to attack Israel because the Hamas policy has been destructive and devastating to the people of the Gaza Strip. That is the reality of what's happening on the ground. So where does this all leave us? What do we do with all this information? We have to understand how important it is to have a strong border between Israel and the Hamas in the Gaza Strip. The people of Gaza deserve a peaceful life. They deserve prosperity. They deserve quiet, as do the people of Israel. And with Hamas in control of the Gaza Strip, that's simply never going to happen. If Gaza is a prison, then Hamas are the prison guards.